following program was produced by students in telecommunicative arts, Department of Speech at Iowa State University, Ames. Iowa Coal, Black Dust or Black Gold? With Marv Ross, Mines and Minerals Division of the Iowa Soil Conservation Commission. The subject of energy has become quite a topic of discussion these days. Announcements of natural gas supply interruptions, oil shortages, nuclear waste disposal problems, which would have been unheard of five years ago, are all a reality today. People around the nation are looking for old ways, both old and new, to meet our needs for energy. In Iowa, a number of researchers are looking at an old way to solve a relatively new problem. They're looking at coal. The coal industry in Iowa dates back to the railroad's expansion across the state. However, in the 1920s and 30s, railroads were converting their locomotives to diesel fuel and electricity. And as a result, Iowa's coal industry declined. In 1974, the Iowa State Legislature appropriated funds for the Energy Mineral Resource Research Institute at Iowa State University to do research into the possible revival of Iowa's coal industry. The Iowa Coal Project was born. Here with me are three researchers from the Iowa Coal Research Project. They'll be discussing several aspects of the project's work. Dr. Lyle Sandline, Assistant Division Chief of Mining and Restoration Group. Mr. Jim Gulliford, the Safety Officer and Assistant Ecologist, also with the Mining and Restoration Group. And Mr. Ray Fisher, Assistant Division Chief of the Coal Beneficiation Group. We'll be back to talk about the Iowa Coal Research Project's research in mining and restoration after this message. Birds. Again. Are you... Once it was against the law in some states to teach a black child to read or write. <laughs> But the law didn't stop them from learning, and the law didn't change till 1863. For the past 30 years, the United Negro College Fund has helped half a million black students change the course of their lives at UNCF colleges. Thousands have become doctors, engineers, and teachers, perhaps changing the course of your life. But today, there just isn't enough money. And tomorrow... We're sorry but this course has been canceled. Please, don't let this happen. Support the United Negro College Fund. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. Dr. Sunline, how does one get started in coal mining? What are some of the things they have to know in order to, to get into the coal mining business? Well, it, it turns out that there's a lot of things that one has to know. In fact, uh, mining in the past in Iowa has been uh, pretty much a one-man business or a family-type business. But uh, for mining to uh, expand in the state, we're going to have to uh, develop a much more uh, methodical way of looking at the, at the coal resources. Of course, one has to know how to find coal. One, once the coal has been found, one uh, has to know how to evaluate the size of the deposit, to know if the quality of the coal is good enough, uh, what the sulfur content is, what's the BTU content of the coal. Uh, after, uh, after you have this uh, taken care of, of course, you have already taken care of the land and tied up the, uh, the land and the mineral rights for the, for the deposit. But then uh, other things that you would be interested in will be, uh, in the future, will be interested in uh, a supply of water so that we will have water to uh, wash the coal with. Uh, I think... Uh, these are just sort of uh, general ideas, the things that, that are required to, uh, to get one prepared for the coal business. Uh, I think the thing that I would, would uh, emphasize is that the, uh, the, 
the business requires uh, quite a, a, a large uh, block of time to get things started. In other words, you just don't get started in the business in just a matter of a few, a few months, but there has to be uh, uh, a lot of planning that goes into the development of, uh, of a mine. Now that you've, you've gathered the information, you've, you've uh, probably drilled a bunch of holes, you know how thick the coal is and uh, what kind of material is on top of it that you call overburden. Once you've collected this information, what's the next step? What do you do after that? Well, as, as you know, Marv, the, uh, the important thing is to now develop a plan. And of course, the mining plan has to, uh, has to be set up so that we will uh, remove the, uh, the, the coal but to do it in, in such a manner so that the land surface can be restored to as good or better condition when, uh, when we're finished with mining. The main problem that we've had with mining in the state and in, in the country has been the development of acid conditions uh, as a result of the mining process. Now, the acid conditions come about because associated with the coal deposits uh, are shale layers that have a lot of pyrite uh, included within them. And these uh, small minerals of pyrite are very susceptible to uh, chemical change. Uh, they change as a result of being exposed to oxygen. And so once these, these uh, minerals are brought to the Earth's surface, it's turned over by the mining, uh, mining method, uh, oxygen gets to them, and uh, oxidation takes place, and a very acid condition uh, develops. And this acid material, then, is uh, very detrimental to streams, uh, if it's left uh, laying on the surface, uh, nothing will grow on this material. And so uh, it's very critical then in the mining plan that we learn how to uh, put this material in a place where it will not uh, uh, interfere with, with, uh, the, with, with, with future mining or with future uh, plant, uh, let's say, what use of the land surface, whether it be growing plants or, or just... Uh, I presume now that uh, we've done this with Iowa State number one demonstration mine. And uh, how are you executing that particular plan on this particular mine? And while you're explaining that, uh, we'll be looking at some pictures that have been taken down at that mine. Well, you know, in setting up the, a mining plan, this, of course, was the first for us. Uh, we were not miners, and we, we got involved in, uh, in, in the actual mining business. So we did put together a plan. And our plan was uh, one that uh, went through several changes uh, because uh, in working with a, 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 a contractor, he uh, gave us some experience, his experience, and asked us that we, we, uh, uh, we change our plans. And once we did, uh, we found that it was uh, relatively easy to, uh, to work with. The, uh, the, the main thing that, that one has to do is, uh, is to develop the kind of machinery that you're going to, to use. Now, in our mine, we're using scrapers. Now, the scraper is a, is a road building equipment, a, a piece of equipment mm -hmm. that is uh, very useful for, uh, for moving overburden. We've also are using bulldozers with rippers, which uh, are used to, uh, to rip the overburden. However, we've, uh, we've actually used this in ripping coal. However, uh, here we see that we're not ripping the coal, but we're actually going to use the uh, dynamite to blast it. Once the coal has been blasted, we then load this out with uh, our front end loader into uh, trucks which are carried over to, uh, to our uh, uh, crushing plant and uh, then, uh, in fact, here's a truck that we're loading it into. It's carried over to the crushing plant, it's crushed, and it's put in a tipple uh, ready for a, a shipment to a, to a, a customer. The, 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 the real key in our project has been the, the use of these scrapers and to determine the cost effectiveness of the scrapers uh, as opposed to the other techniques that are used in the, in the uh, industry. Well, in using these scrapers, how effective have they been in, uh, as far as uh, enabling you to make uh, surface mining for coal more socially acceptable? Well, the real key is the fact of now getting this acid material in a place where, uh, where it will not do any harm in the future. And in order to do that, you've got to be able to you see, we've got the overburden material, then we've got the shales, and then the coal. Now, the shales, let's say, are the bad, the bad actors. They have the pyrite in them. And in order to, uh, to, to get at the coal, we're going to have to overturn this system. Now, what we do is we pick the, the overburden up, and we'll put it in one pile. Then we pick the clay, the bad shale up with the pyrite in it, put it in another pile. Then we take the coal out. Now, once we have our pit, then we can start the system whereby we keep 
We will remove now the overburden off the next cut. We'll have to stockpile it, but then we'll take the shale and we'll put that back into the pit. Okay, now the next pit, we'll pick the shale or the good material off the surface, put it on top of the shale in the first pit, and now we've got a system which keeps continuing uh, up, the, up the slope as we, uh, as we mine. Now this is actually a, a very good way of uh, controlling the placement of the acid spoils, and this is what the scraper does where it's very difficult to do this with a, with a straight drag line. Well, that's real interesting. Now let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the question of safety, both as, uh, as it relates to the environment and uh, as well as to the operators. Uh, what are some of the potential areas of concern environmentally as far as grit mining is concerned? Well, there are a great many areas of environmental concern. One of, a, one of particular importance might be the water problems at a mine. You have problems of erosion during mining, sedimentation as the soil is loosened and removed every time it rains <coughs> the soil can be carried into the watershed of your mine there are problems of leaching through the toxic overburdens that Dr. Senline was referring to these could bring out trace elements harmful harmful elements into your water system and downstream everywhere from you and uh, there's other problems of dust and soil changes as, as long as as long as you do get the good topsoil back on top of your mining when you're done, then these problems can be avoided. Uh, what steps are we taking to avoid these problems? Well, Iowa State has developed an interesting set of water control measures at our mine, whereby all of the water that comes onto our area, on our, onto our land surface, is kept on our land surfaces. We have developed dikes and a siltation pond at the bottom of our mine, at the lowest point in our mine, to prevent loss of siltation, loss of silt during rain, from the mine, we've uh, also we've also done been very careful to segregate these acid materials from these non-toxic materials, as Dr. Senline has mentioned, and this will prevent these mixing and the toxic material appearing on the surface and affecting the land for years to come. Uh, how about the health and safety of the miners? Uh, the surface mining is uh, hazardous to the uh, to the miners as deep deep mining. In Iowa, the the whole mining industry in Iowa has developed a, what we we would call a very safe program. The shaft mining in Iowa is assisted by the fact that no methane gas has ever been detected underground in Iowa mine. This is one of the biggest potential dangers in mining underground. The safety, mi the safety of a surface mine is, of course, a different problem because we don't have to worry about <coughs> root falls and things like that. Here we're very concerned with dust problems. The miners, as they work these heavy equipment out of doors, they are exposed to dust from shale, from, from the soil, and these are very serious problems for the miners. So it's important to develop a good safety program with the miners so that you're able to determine when they feel that something that they're doing is unsafe for their health or uh, in an accident situation and so that they can come to you and explain the problems as they see them and you can do your make, make your effort to correct these problems and to, and to think about their health and, and take care of them. Uh, are you doing some specific things experimentally as far as uh, dust uh, and exposure of miners to dust is concerned? We've found dust to be probably the biggest problem safety-wise, health-wise, at our mine. And so we've not only tried to prepare for this by issuing respirators to the men on very dusty days, but we have also have things like a water wagon to wash the, wash the dust off of the haul roads. Uh, we've, we're looking into different types of equipment and a uh, water wetting process on the coal itself after it's been mined and put in the tipple in order to prevent dust, which is not only a hazard to health, but it's also a loss of product. Whenever you lose dust from coal, this is some of your product that you're losing. Also, this can be taken into the town if you're loading your coal out of a town. And in an urban environment, dust has to be controlled in these situations also. Well, you mentioned the tipple. Once the coal has been removed, uh, where does it go and how does it get there? Well, coal can be uh, shipped to the customer by uh, several uh, uh, methods. One uh, method, of course, would be by truck. And the second method would be uh, uh, by rail. Now, we're actually shipping coal from our mine to, uh, to uh, one customer by truck. The trucks uh, load up at the tipple, go up to a Pella, way up, and then uh, transport the coal on to, uh, to the customer. This, uh, the truck uh, satisfies all the, uh, the requirements of the state for hauling uh, heavy loads on, on uh, state highways. The rail head, we must, tra we must transport the coal from the uh, from the uh, uh, mine to the railhead, and then we, we load it into uh, coal cars and it's shipped by, by rail.
San Francisco, 1906. A.P. Giannini reaches his little bank as flames spread throughout the city. He has no vault, so he takes the bank's $80,000 back home. Thousands are homeless. The big banks call a month-long holiday. But Giannini, with a couple of planks and a bag of money, reopens. He gives out loans, often on the strength of a man's character alone. People respond. In six weeks, deposits exceed withdrawals. A.P. Giannini's spirit and commitment to humanize his business helped build the Bank of America into the largest bank in the United States. This has been a presentation of the Chamber of Commerce of the United States in celebration of America's bicentennial. I guess the first question I should ask you, Ray, is just what is coal beneficiation? Well, I think it's just as the name implies, it's to, to benefit or to improve the quality of the coal. Uh, we want to remove the non-combustible materials, uh, rocks and the shale and the other type of material. And uh, in Iowa in particular, we'd like to remove the sulfur compounds, uh, uh, the pyrite and uh, various other uh, sulfur-bearing materials and uh, end up with a good, clean product that uh, burns with a minimum of ash. Uh, you're concerned primarily with mechanical beneficiation, and we, we had this plant on campus that was dedicated during this year. The governor came up and pushed the button, got things started off. I wonder if you'd like to tell us a little bit about this plant while we uh, look at some pictures of it. Be glad to, Marva. Uh, the mechanical beneficiation uh, depends on gravity for separating the material. Coal is fairly light. It weighs about a one and three tenth times as much as water. And the pyrites and the rocks may weigh three to five times as much as water. So what we do is make a artificial high gravity uh, liquid. And in our particular case, we use magnetite, which is a very finely divided iron ore. And it is so fine, it's finer than the paste powder. Uh, 325 mesh is the grade, and it is suspended in water, and, uh, and we can add as much as we need, and so we float the coal at a specific gravity of about 1.5. Now, that, that takes off the, the good coal, let the rocks and the sulfur-bearing material sink to the bottom, and we scalp the coal and, uh, and uh, take off the, the refuse at the bottom and dispose of it. Uh. What, what problems have you run into in building this, uh, this particular type of plant? Well, we started out with a, a real bad problem, and that was our site location. Uh, we didn't get our first choice for uh, locating the plant, and it was uh, uh, put in a, some low ground, and before we could get the uh, ground built up, we had the 100-year high frequency flood and had four feet of water on the area, so we had to wait until it uh, drained away and the uh, surface moisture uh, declined enough so that we could bring in clay and, and uh, build it up. And then, of course, uh, we were new at, at this business. Uh, coal processing was, was just, uh, uh, had just come into uh, our vocabulary, and uh, so we had to learn about what kind of materials and what kind of equipment they used to process coal. So we visited other areas and looked at equipment and tried to evaluate it one against the other, and uh, I tried to find some uh, companies who would uh, uh, manufacture the equipment of the size that we wanted. We are uh, building a demonstration or a pilot plant, a uh, 70 to 75 ton per hour uh, uh, coal plant, and most of the large plants that we visited were over 1,000 tons an hour. And uh, many of the companies, and uh, in fact, uh, we were hard pressed to find any that were willing to to worry about our little plant. So uh, getting that, evaluating the equipment, and then designing it so that uh, four or five different processes would, would mesh together uh, required 150 or 200 sets of plans, structural drawings, and, and this sort of thing. Hmm. Sounds real interesting. You've, uh, you've had a few test runs. Have you found any problems, any bugs in the, in the operation so far? Well, uh, pilot plants aren't a new thing to me. Uh, this is my fifth different pilot plant, and they always have bugs when they start out. Uh, we were quite fortunate in this case, I think, 
although we have not shaken it down to the extent I'd like yet. But uh, there, uh, we had the occurrence of the normal amount of, of leaks that had to be welded shut. Uh, we had a complete stoppage the second day of operation, and we couldn't understand why. So we uh, had to uh, take the whole plant down and uh, drain the magnetite in the water, and we found four pieces of welding rod that had been dropped into the bottom of a cone that were caught up in the, in the bottom of that cone that you see there in the, the bottom section, and uh, it just served as a, as a spider web to hold the coal and the refuse. And so as soon as we freed that, why then we've had uh, no major problem since that, except for one, and that is that the case of our equipment working too well. Uh, we uh, uh, specified and installed certain uh, water removing devices because in the process of our uh, coal we have to uh, uh, use water and then we have to dry it afterwards and uh, uh, it removed too much water and so the coal wouldn't flow. The picture you see there before you they're moving the main uh, heavy media plant in place. Uh, it's the uh, was built by the Eagle Iron Works in uh, Des Moines. Uh, it was modified to our specifications uh, from a uh, aggregate processing plant. Uh, it is really what we call, has been called, start with a portable plant, but really I would rather call it a movable <coughs> plant. Uh, it, it came to Ames in five truckloads, and uh, uh, we could set it up, and I think it was set up in an under three days. So I think an entire plant of this type with the auxiliary equipment, once we know what we know now, could be set up in probably uh, 30 days to two months' time. Are there some other options for beneficiating coal besides the mechanical ones that we've been discussing here? Yes, there's a, there are a number of them, really. Uh, one of the principal ones that we're studying here at Ames is the chemical uh, beneficiation, uh, not only to break up the coal, which uh, we call a chemical comminution, uh, where the certain chemicals go into the, the cleavage planes and split the coal apart instead of just crushing it and producing a great deal of fines, and uh, uh, some high pressure, uh, we're using uh, 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 technique of various types of gases at high pressures and at elevated temperatures, and uh, ammonia for one, or then certain acids used. Uh, many of them work, uh, most of them are quite expensive. And so really to get the gross amount of sulfur out, the mechanical uh, process seems to work best. One of our big projects that we're going to undertake or ha and have in the works is the processing of fine coal. I think Jim mentioned earlier about uh, uh, not losing this fine coal. And we find from most coal washing plants and coal processing operations that uh, uh, a lot of that fine coal is lost. And the finer the coal is divided, uh, of course, it, the easier it is to separate it from the sulfur and the other non-combustible uh, materials. But by the same token, you have a problem of recombining it and separating it. So uh, we use a froth flotation, which is a, a frothing uh, technique, which combines chemistry and physical separation to float the coal on uh, adhering to little bubbles of air floating in the water. And uh, strangely enough, you can add a depressant, and you can have the light coal go to the bottom. Or by adding another agent, you can have it float on the top. And then after you get these tiny particles uh, skimmed off and the coal is separated from the, from the refuse, it still is very finely divided. So we're doing some oil agglomeration work where we add certain types of, of uh, chemicals and that uh, causes these tiny particles to stick to one another and agglomerate. And then we'll put it in a uh, pelletizing device where sort of like a ball mill where this stuff like mud balls will form. And, and as you rotate it slowly and heat it, the, the coal will form a uh, small pellets maybe an inch in, in diameter so we can have some uh, easy handling of it. Is it going to be possible to work some of these other options into uh, the mechanical beneficiation plant? We're hoping to uh, work all of them in. Uh, funds are our main uh, drawback right now. Uh, we have asked the, the state for additional funds or we're going to uh, officially ask them in, uh, in, one of the, in the next uh, session. Uh, we've gone to the government the, uh, to for help, uh, both the EPA and the ERDA, and uh, 
uh, we're hoping that we'll get some, some funds to do this work. And then the main object of this plant is to put the various uh, units together and operate one against the other and compare their efficiencies, operating efficiencies, their cost uh, benefit ratio, and then we'll be able to tell the, the smaller coal operator that you can take items A, C, and D in your particular type of coal, and that will give you a product that will cost you X number of dollars a ton to process, and it will have so many BTUs and uh, uh, certain sulfur content and uh, ash content. That's what I was wondering. Just uh, what are we going to be able to do with this high sulfur coal? How, uh, how effective will it be in getting the sulfur out? Well, I think you have the answer. There's two, two parts of this answer. In the short run, uh, we expect, and our bench scale tests show, that we can take out about half the sulfur. And I don't think that will give us any real problem of doing this by mechanical means. If we have to go to a, a much lower uh, percentage of the sulfur than that, we'll have to go to a chemical or uh, uh, method, uh, which will be much <coughs> more sophisticated, will be more expensive, mm. so we'll have to uh, just uh, factor that in. There may be deposits of coal based on our present technology that we shouldn't mine and process at all until we have developed better techniques and, and newer techniques. We've been talking with Mr. Ray Fisher. He's the Assistant Division Chief of the Iowa Coal Proce Project on coal refining. Iowa coal is not the final chapter in the large book on Iowa's energy situation, but rather it will buy the time that scientists and researchers need to develop new all-inclusive uh, energy systems. You've got to develop them to the point where they'll be ready to be practical. There's a number of these alternatives just down the road, but Iowa coal is here now. It's waiting to be used. And in the interim, the Iowa Coal Research Project is working to make its use more and more economical and environmentally sound and acceptable. I want to thank Mr. Fisher, as well as Dr. Lyle Sandline, Assistant Chief in Charge of Mining and Restoration, Jim Gulliford, the Safety Officer and Assistant Ecologist from the Iowa Coal Project, all of them for their participation in this Iowa Coal Black Dust or Black Gold. I'm Marv Ross. Thank you for watching. Iowa Coal, Black Dust or Black Gold. Produced and directed by Blake Lewis. Associate Director, Dave Eshelman. Audio, Jim DeHoot. Cameras, Fred Eastman and Mike Wilson. Floor Director, Al Ruchel. Lighting Director, Mike Wilson. Assisted by Deanne Luger. Production assistant, Larry Mesward. Projection, Jim Farrell. And faculty director, Dr. George P. Wilson, Jr. Iowa Coal, Black Dust or Black Gold? The preceding program was produced by students in Telecommunicative Arts, Department of Speech at Iowa State University in Ames.